The man who defined cool for generations, Sir Sean Connery was born 94 years ago today. We never left. Welcome to the Confessions of a Not So Dangerous Mind podcast. I want to thank you all for spending some of your Sunday morning here with me in New York. Once again, we're going to skip past all that promotional jazz, and get right to the guts of the episode. Today would have been Sean Connery's 94th birthday. He passed in October of 2020 and really had been almost entirely out of the public eye for quite some time. His final film, unfortunately, was 2002's The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which had all the makings of being a terrific film. It just wasn't that good. Great ideas, but mm, the movie should have been better. And the director of that film, Stephen Norrington, we know is talented because he did the first Blade movie, which I recently talked about on the channel, on its anniversary, 26th anniversary. But apparently, Sir Sean and Norrington did not get along at all. And Connery was not somebody who was necessarily had a reputation for being a diva or difficult to work with. So I don't know what the beef was, but he supposedly took a crack at the director I don't know if he slugged him, but it was something that was bad. And his experience there was enough, there was enough bad that he walked away and did not work again after he was 71 when um, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was shot. It's not that old. He had a long way to go. You got Harrison Ford, his son, his cinematic son, still working at 82 and working a pretty frenetic pace, if I may say. But Sean, I guess he had just had enough. So when he passed, it was a bit of a shock because he really hadn't been in the news. He just, you know, wanted to live out his remaining years. I know he spent time, was he in Bermuda, Bahamas? Um, he used to go to the U.S. Open Tennis Championships in Flushing Meadows, New York. I know as late as like 2014 or 2015, he attended the U.S. Open. So it's not as if he became a hermit or a recluse. Like he didn't do the Johnny Carson thing where when Johnny retired, he retired from late night, 1992. He made one more appearance. I think he went on with Letterman and he didn't really say anything, but Johnny just quietly exited stage right and never came back. He didn't make any cameos in movies, he, nothing. He completely disappeared from public view. People who played golf with him and saw him, you know, but he did not. So when he died, people hadn't heard, oh, Johnny Carson, he was still around. He just vanished from public life. And Sean Connery was very low profile. And there are really only two people that are even on Sean Connery's level as far as achievements and respect that they engendered. The two people who are still with us, Gene Hackman, Clint Eastwood. And Gene Hackman's been retired for two decades. He hasn't worked since Welcome to Mooseport. He was 73 going on 74 when he made that movie and seemed to have had a reasonably okay experience, but he had enough. He wanted to do something else with his remaining years. Hackman wrote a couple of books. He made appearances. He's living a quiet life. I think he lives in New Mexico. He has an unbelievable spread, not surprisingly. And Clint, still working, finished work on the film Juror Number 2, which nobody really knows when it's coming out. It was going to premiere at the Cannes Film Festival, and now nobody knows what the fuck, which end is up. But Sean Connery, Scottish, the first, he's not really the first James Bond. Uh, well, no, actually, he, he was. Uh, what I mean is, I, I always get mixed up because David Niven technically plays James Bond in Casino Royale, but Casino Royale uh, came out later. I don't think it was as early as uh, Dr. No from Russia with Love. But the first cinematic incarnation that everyone knows and loves of the character of James Bond was played by Sean Connery. And Connery played six... He, he played Bond six times before, after Diamonds Are Forever, he ceded the role to Roger Moore, 
And then he made a comeback in 83. Moore could have put up much a much bigger fuss than he did because Never Say Never Again, that was the 1983 renegade Bond film that Connery starred in. Um, Moore didn't really say shit. He loved Sean and he made his movie Octopussy, Octopussy. And Connery did Never Say Never Again. And if we're being honest, I think Never Say Never Again is one of the better films in the entire franchise. If anything, Connery's performance is better as a slightly, well, not even slightly, as an older Bond. The stakes feel higher. He's not indestructible. Some of the crazy shit that he survives in movies like Goldfinger. What, are you kidding me? Like Daniel Craig, the Energizer Bunny in Casino Royale. How many different times? Daniel Craig in Casino Royale. It's like the old joke from the movie Ghostbusters 2. Daniel Craig in Casino Royale is poisoned, shot, stabbed, hung, disemboweled, drawn and quartered. They do almost everything to him. He just keeps pulling himself up. He's like Jack Bauer on the show 24, where in a span of 24 hours, Jack Bauer is killed and brought back to life, reanimated corpse a couple of times, doesn't sleep, doesn't eat, doesn't shit, doesn't pee, doesn't do anything other than get the shit kicked out of him and dispense a lot of pain. Sean Connery took the role, which was an unknown, it was a character that was known from the books, but it was not something where there was audience identification, the way Daniel Craig could have sunk or swum on his own merits, and he he really swam. I mean, he was Michael Phelps, if you ask me. Perfectly cast. But with no prior movie audience identification of this character of James Bond, Sean Connery played the role with the confidence befitting a guy who was already a major star, and he really wasn't that big of a star when he first got the role. He was in his early 30s. Connery was already wearing a hairpiece. He lost his hair. He was a young guy. What are you going to do, right? Shit happens. Took the role, made it his own, and Dr. No from Russia with Love, and especially Goldfinger. Goldfinger was the one that put the franchise over the top almost permanently. It is one of those iconic films. Honestly, it's not that good. I mean, if we're being brutally honest here, or I should say it's not as good as its reputation. I don't think that it's Connery's necessarily his best of the first run of Bond films. The series, though, got kind of bogged down with the gimmickry as the movies went along, and but Connery still sold it. Although the character is a little bit inconsistent, um, great NYU professor Toby Miller, who made almost his life's work studying the James Bond series up through the mid-1990s. He loved Goldeneye, for whatever that's worth. But he pointed out that the, the way that the Bond character is presented, there are certain deaths within the films that Bond doesn't react enough to, given what the character apparently meant to him, and then other deaths where he has an outsized reaction. And this is not something that I would have ever paid attention to. But it shows that maybe the filmmakers didn't know exactly how they wanted Bond to come across. Is he really a thinking, breathing feeling human, or is he more of a kind of robotic, womanizing, brilliant, tough-as-nails secret agent? The Daniel Craig, that's what he was, but he also had his moments of joy, rarely, and sadness. But Connery, there's almost nobody who says that he wasn't a great Bond. It's just a matter of how do you compare him to the others? And sometimes it's a matter of what the director is going for, what the story is, because some of the stories that Connery's Bond goes through are more serious than others. The truth is the character of Auric Goldfinger, the guy is like a clown. He's not a fearsome villain like the best of Blofeld or some of the other, some of the other Bond villains we've seen. Honestly, Franz Sanchez from the Timothy Dalton License to Kill, Franz Sanchez would, would take Aura Goldfinger and stuff him into a garbage can. He, actually, no, what he would do is he would feed him to his fucking alligators or his sharks. So it wasn't the most intimidating Bond villain. Although they had that one great exchange where Goldfinger has to drop on Bond. It looks like Bond's going to get killed. And Sean Connery with that incredible manner and that just amazing, the confidence of a guy who knows that he's the man. You expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. 
Absolute gold. No pun intended. The thing with Connery, though, and it's important to note this, and a lot of other James Bond actors, not so much Roger Moore, but you don't want to just be known for that. And typecasting can be beneficial from the audience identification perspective, but it can hurt from the perspective of wanting to be remembered for something other than this one role. And the late, great Christopher Reeve, as much wonderful work as he did outside of playing Clark Kent Kal-El Superman, for better or worse, he'll always be cinema's greatest Clark Kent Kal-El Superman. For most people, Sean Connery will always be the GOAT of James Bond actors. And I talked about how, for me, I feel that Timothy Dalton in his two films did the best because he gives home run performances in both. But anybody who says that Connery is the guy, no, this is, that's subjective. I know people who can't stand Timothy Dalton. They think that the movies were okay, especially License to Kill, although I prefer Living Daylights, to say, oh, he had the wrong handle on the character. Okay, it's fine. It's what makes a horse race. We're all just giving opinions here. I'm a film geek. You're presumably a film geek if you've even gotten this far into the episode. But the idea, the concept of audience identification and typecasting, as much as Connery is defined, and certainly in the 60s was defined by the James Bond films that he made, as they say, Dr. No, From Russia With Love, Goldfinger, You Only Live Twice, Thunderball, Diamonds Are Forever. You Only Live Twice, I think, is the weakest film in that initial run. And again, in film school, watching that movie in popular culture and everyday life almost three decades ago with Toby Miller, he talked about how problematic that film is. Now, you can argue that every James Bond movie with Connery is problematic, with the exception of Never Say Never Again. But it's problematic because of the way that he treats women and some of the other things that go on, the cultural appropriations. I mean, there's a whole sequence in You Only Live Twice, which is horrendous. So there's that. But while Connery was making those movies, they were all successful one way or another, either artistically, commercially, or both. He was doing different things. He did Marnie with Alfred Hitchcock. You probably didn't know offhand, unless you're somebody like me, that Sean Connery did an Alfred Hitchcock film after having made, I believe, two. He had shot two James Bond films, if I'm not mistaken. And he made Marnie, which it's a film that has its defenders that will put it in Hitchcock's top five because it has a lot of real crazy psychological stuff. But Connery plays a character who starts the film. He comes across like the suave, debonair, James Bond type character. Character of Mark Runtman's a scumbag. He's not a good guy at all. And that film goes really deep. And um, Tippi Hedren, Melanie Griffith's mom, she had done The Birds, and The Birds was a terrible experience for her, uh, despite the fact that artistically it's one of Hitchcock's greatest achievements. I still don't know how he able, was able to pull it off, but he did. But Tippi had been traumatized, and Hitchcock wanted Grace Kelly. Grace Kelly kept, as much as she loved Alfred, she was retired, she wasn't making a comeback. And Hitchcock, to his last days, rude the fact that he shot the movie To Catch a Thief in Monaco, opening the door for Grace Kelly to meet Prince Rainier and give the proverbial double middle finger salute permanently to the movie business. Oh, well. But he worked with Hitchcock in a totally different kind of role. And then later in the decade, I'm not sure if it was 66, 67, Connery made a vicious vicious war movie called The Hill, directed by Sidney Lumet, New York City's finest, one of the all-timers who was working well into his 80s, even Clint Eastwood joking around when he won Oscar for Million Dollar Baby, and Sidney Lumet in 2004 had just wrapped the movie Find Me Guilty, Vin Diesel with hair. Sidney Lumet, what an incredible career going back to 12 Angry Men. But the movie The Hill, Connery plays what amounts to a prisoner of war, World War II, in a battle of wills with the kind of commander of the prison camp. And it is a very difficult movie. It is challenging. 
beautifully acted. It's some of Connery's best film acting, if you ask me. And I know it's not as well known as certainly Lumet, so many of his others and Connery's others, but it showed that he wanted to keep trying something different. He was never satisfied just playing Bond. And I have nothing but respect for that. And the fact that he didn't make that many safe choices. He did the Bond films. He was always uncomfortable with the attention and all that stuff. He kind of was a shy, retiring type of guy. Not a huge personality in public. Gave a good interview, sometimes a little too well. But he wanted to test himself, expand. So after Diamonds Are Forever, he retired from the role. And here comes his buddy, Roger Moore. And Roger Moore, I, I love Roger Moore. Roger Moore, similar to Pierce Brosnan, not coincidentally two James Bond actors, Roger Moore was a guy that many major players in the movie business could not take seriously because of what he looked like. Because he, they said his features were so even, this guy is a joke. This is a male model. What is he doing in movies? He should just be doing print work. And they said the same about Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan, as he, the joke was, he's so preposterously handsome, you just want to laugh at the guy. People said similar things about Roger Moore. Connery, of course, an attractive man, but he's an attractive man in normal, like the kind of rough hewn, like the Clint Eastwood sort of way. How do you quantify these things? Connery, though, made some really interesting films in the 70s and 80s when he wasn't doing James Bond, always striving to do something different. Movies like Zardoz. And of course, he did, um, what was the name of the movie he did with uh, with Sir Michael Caine, The Two Sirs? Um, boy, it's embarrassing. The Man Who Would Be King. I almost had to Google it. Holy shit. He continued to reinvent himself, to not read his lines in the exact same way, to not take films off. A movie like Zardoz, he's running around in a loincloth for crying out loud. Like, what the fuck? And he did movies in the early 80s like Outland with Peter Hines. Many people think that's a like, kind of underappreciated masterpiece. Great Train Robbery, he did. He just kept working. He didn't take that much time off. And my first exposure to him, the first movie I saw with Sean Connery, it's funny, this is a good mental game to play with yourself. Um... Play with you. That, that didn't exactly come out the way that I wanted it to. This was not supposed to reach NC-17 today. Again, humble apologies. But an interesting game that you can play. A mental game. Think of a big star. It could be a young person. You could talk Robert Pattinson and say the first time you saw him was Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. But me, as an older person, when I think of the major players in Hollywood, the first time I saw Paul Newman in a movie... Dad was watching The Sting. First time I saw Henry Fonda, Sidney Lumet's 12 Angry Men. The first time I saw Clint Eastwood, right turn, Clyde. Right turn, Clyde. First time I saw Sean Connery was when my dad, way back at the beginning of VHS, VCR, state-of-the-art technology circa 1983. He rented Never Say Never Again. And I said, oh my God, this guy is great. I had watched pieces of For Your Eyes Only and I think a little bit of Moonraker prior. Not that into it. I loved Never Say Never Again. So my first identification of Sean Connery and with Sean Connery was his last turn, the seventh and final turn as 007 in Never Say Never Again. I, I love that movie. There are plenty of people saying, well, it's a, more or less a remake of Thunderball. And it, okay. I still think the film is fantastic. And it's certainly in my top five favorite James Bond films. If I'm going, uh, not in any order, Living Daylights, License to Kill, Goldfinger, Casino Royale, Never Say Never Again. That would be my kind of unofficial top five. Connery, though, continued to work, continued to try to do interesting work. He did a movie right around the time, I think it was just before he went to film Never Say Never Again, he did a movie called Wrong is Right, which is kind of like a networky type movie by network, meaning the 1976 Oscar winner with Peter Finch, uh, Faye Dunaway, Ned Beatty, among others. But Wrong is Right, a movie about where the media almost 
is not reporting the stories. They're like creating the stories and I hate to say creating the news, but it's in that ballpark. So it was not really a film that you would expect, a dark comedy from Sir Sean. But he ended up winning an Oscar. And even with the incredible career that he'd had as he kind of went into his 50s and all the work, as I said, that he did in the 70s and in the early part of the 80s, people weren't really thinking, I wonder if one day Sean Connery will win an Oscar. Or if they were, there really isn't much reporting at the time. But Brian De Palma, a filmmaker I absolutely adore, even though Scarface to me is wildly overrated. I'm sorry. I don't think it's even a good movie. I love Al Pacino, the accent. I, I want to do a, somebody, maybe someone already did this on YouTube. Compare Al Pacino's Cuban accent from Scarface, John Malkovich's Russian accent from Rounders. That would be absolute gold. Tony Montana and Teddy KGB in a room together. Yeah, I'd sign up for that. But Brian De Palma is an enormously talented filmmaker. He just, a lot of the stories that he chose, I mean, just, I don't think were quite worthy of his talents. But that's beside the point. The Untouchables, unquestionably, Brian De Palma in his top five. I mean, I love Dress to Kill. I'm a huge fan of the first Mission Impossible, which was him. Carlito's Way is brilliant. He's done some exemplary work. The Untouchables, though. De Palma always knew that he wanted Sean Connery to play what ended up being his Oscar-winning role for supporting actor of Irish cop, not Scottish, Jimmy Malone. And I'm not sure if he always had in mind Costner for the lead. That I don't know. He wanted De Niro for uh, Al Capone. But De Niro was so busy. He was working on Angel Heart. He'd had a very protracted and difficult shoot with Brazil and with the mission. Bobby D was working like crazy. And so De Palma didn't know if he was going to be able to get Mr. De Niro for Al Capone. And the late great, another actor I love, who framed Roger Rabbit and um, his greatest role, The Long Good Friday, Bob Hoskins. Someone my sister actually knew personally because when she was in London, my sister that is, she took an acting class with Bob Hoskins' daughter. It's fucking amazing. Bob Hoskins, lifetime home run hitter, all-timer, a great actor, no matter what he was doing, whether he was doing comedy or drama. He could be fearsome, he could be funny, he could be warm and cuddly. The guy was just incredible. But Brian De Palma had Bob Hoskins on standby for the Untouchables if he was not able to get De Niro. And Bob Hoskins, I think, ended up getting paid about $500,000. It might have even been more. When De Niro said, you know, De Niro's, okay, okay, okay. So he signed on. Let me tell you something. Hoskins also would have been great as Capone. De Niro is fantastic, though. He get, It's kind of a serial comic performance because Capone has moments of humor and moments of real fucking bro bloody, brutal violence. But Connery is amazing as Jimmy Malone. And if people say, yeah, he deserved that fucking Oscar. That was not a Lifetime Achievement Award with Connery at 56 or 57, however old he was. He earned it. He's great. He elevates Costner's performance and Andy Garcia and Charles Martin Smith just by virtue of how powerful he is. And he almost thinly coiled wellspring of rage that he has for Capone. It's fantastic. Now, my favorite, my forever favorite, when Sean passed, and I was crushed, even though, as I said, he hadn't worked in more in almost two decades, right? Uh, more than two, yeah, 18 years, I'm sorry, 17, 18 years. When he passed, my first thought was not Jimmy Malone in The Untouchables, my first thought was not 007, the best James Bond or all the Bond films. My first thought was Professor Henry Jones Sr. Steven Spielberg, his holy trilogy, it's what I remember him most for. When I think of Spielberg, my first thought is not Schindler's List or Empire of the Sun or AI 
or Munich or Amistad or Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Certainly not Hook. It's the Indiana Jones trilogy. And Spielberg went for broke and somehow got Sean Connery to play a somewhat comedic part as Indiana Jones' father, Henry. And we don't realize until the end of the third movie that Indiana is not his real name. I mean, we can kind of surmise, but his name is Henry. Connery in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. That is, for me, his defining work. It's only one role in one movie. He didn't come back for part four as much as they wanted him to. Spielberg begged and pleaded and pleaded and begged and offered him the moon financially, and we know Spielberg could afford it. But Connery is so good. He's funny, and yet we get him. There's so many just amazing moments between two final boss level movie stars in Connery and Harrison. And Connery realistically is not old enough to play Harrison's dad, but he's supposed to be older and Ford is definitely playing younger than he was. I think that Indy's probably supposed to be 40 and he's the real Harrison Ford was like 47, 46, 47 when Last Crusade was made. It's such a beautifully calibrated performance. Connery is fire in every scene so committed to the role. He made me believe they were related, even though they looked nothing alike. Moments of fear and one unbelievable moment when he thinks that Indy has perished. And maybe he hasn't been the best dad. And I never got to tell my own son how much he meant to me. And heaven forbid, how proud I was and am of him for also being an academic a real archaeologist, completely unafraid. It's such an extraordinary performance. And um, man, I love Quentin Tarantino, but Tarantino, I say, is totally off base. He has talked about, and you know he loves Spielberg, considers him a friend. Tarantino's favorite of the three indie films is Temple of Doom. He loves it because it's dark, because Spielberg was in a dark place and wasn't really having such a great time in life, despite the fact, I think Temple of Doom is a fucking rip. What a great movie. But all three, to me, are masterpieces. They're all 10 out of 10. But Tarantino said, I love Sean, but I don't like his character. I feel like Indy's father kind of brings the movie down a little bit. Bullshit. No way. And when Connery passed, my first thought was, Godspeed to the original 007, to Jimmy Malone, but especially to Professor Henry Jones Sr. Sir Sean Connery, an all-timer, one of the great stars in the history of cinema, somebody who always strived for greatness, and more often than not, he didn't just achieve it, he crushed it. 94 years ago today, he was born. This has been episode 287 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I want to thank you all. I'm sorry I got a little, a little choked up here for joining me on this Sunday morning here in New York. If you check out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platforms such as Podbean, Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, or any of the others in which we're hosted, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, and turn on those notifications. I'll be back with a new episode real, real soon. Till then, peace.